Guys, welcome back to Breakthrough Conversations. My name is Brett English. I'm joined by Peter Sharp from The Liberators. Hey. Thank you so much. Great to be here, Brett. Thanks for inviting me. No worries, man. I'm really intrigued about um, Bliss Festival. And you mentioned earlier the quest and the journey that it's, it's, it's brought you on and, and, and the why. Mm -hmm. So we have created a three-day immersive experience, pretty much. Uh, we realized that even using the word festival is kind of misleading. Um, because it, we really are trying to do something different and that does relate to the key creators journeys but uh, what I like to call it is a hybrid between your best friend's wedding, uh, adventure world, a fringe show and a wellness retreat. That's kind of what we're creating and um, it's an opportunity to involve people in an experience that hopefully enriches them on such a level that they go home with a deeper connection to who they really are and the gifts that they have to bring in this world and a whole heap of new connections and um, yeah feel supported like really feel uplifted and supported so that's like a big centerpiece of what we're doing and we do it in a number of different ways um, that, that sounds epic yeah i'm intrigued with the adventure world have you got like some Carnival rides and things like that, or is this yep. top secret? Uh, no, some of it's secret, some of it's not. Uh, yep. We have a, an inflatable water park that we install in the middle of the lake, um, which has a slide on it and a trampoline and a place to play. Uh, playfulness is a big part of what we love to cultivate. Um, everyone who is on stage is actually in service to something greater, which is the awakening of the people, the guests, the participants of their own innate potential. So it's not so much about bowing down to the people up front, it's actually about the people up front being in service to the crowd so that the crowd can become radiantly alive, full of life, in love with the human experience and back to that playful self, you know. Mm -hmm. So wow. that adventure world I think is connected to that playful self. Dude, that, that sounds really cool. And whereabouts is it? Stony Brook, two and a half hours from Perth, a beautiful wedding venue, luscious. Wow. Luscious space with uh, green grasses and beautiful leafy trees and yeah, it's a camping thing. Everyone camps. Can you can you leave and come back? Like if you wanted to exit? Uh, no, nope. it's an, an immersive experience. So yeah. from the start, you pretty You're much in. dive in to a whole journey which unfolds. Epic, man. Epic. Yeah. I don't have a tent yet, but I might buy one for that. <laughs> that's incredible, man. But yes, there's um, a whole story behind how we got to this point. And I guess that's a really interesting thing to explore. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to share a bit about the story and... and and the why and how this all unfolded? Um, this mythical quest? Sure, the sure, sure thing. There's three key people involved. Yeah. Um, one of them's Passan, he's the chairman of Blazing Swan, and he also has his whole own journey that's brought him to liberation. And there's also Lakey, who's another collaborator, who is an incredible human being. We've all been brought together on this journey exploring freedom. Um, we connected many years ago after I had started doing flash mobs in public spaces mm. where I saw an opportunity to create, not fight the existing system, create a more beautiful system or create a more beautiful example of how we can relate to each other in public spaces. So for example, we would start a sing-along on a train on a Monday morning and hand out the lyrics to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And we would invite strangers to celebrate the moment and commend each other for waking up so early by singing a song. And uh, next minute, we've got like 20, 30 complete strangers singing their hearts out to a ukulele player and singer that we brought on and sent a powerful ripple, like not just in that moment, but online, we started a YouTube channel yeah. where we were distributing these messages of freedom out into the world. And it's led to a global following where people all over the world have wanted to emulate what we do. and that has been a part of our journey is like, how do we empower people to participate in changing this narrative, changing this story for the better? Mm -hmm. And how do we help enable people to feel proud citizens of the earth, um, citizens of humanity? Because that I feel is a really valuable thing to be working towards as we population increases and mm -hmm. you know, this polarization continues in all different areas. Um, I feel it's really valuable to be looking at ways to build sustainable communities, sustainable networks and more love for each other. Yeah. And uh, we have this 
ancient architecture that lives inside of us, um, which has been given to us by thousands of years, which is the beauty of singing together. Mm. When we sing together, we feel naturally united, regardless of our differences. When we literally harmonize our voices, there is this um, change in our internal biology that enables social bonding to occur more naturally. And we have a few different pieces of internal architecture to the human experience that helps us come together as people. And that's really what we're all really fascinated in exploring and continuing to bring to the surface so that, uh, wow. yeah, we feel more connected. That's epic. How do you go on YouTube? Did that, did that go viral, these, these types of videos? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think more than 100 million views worldwide. Wow. Um, multiple videos, millions of views. 200,000 followers on YouTube um, and what's really special, not just followers or people who click like, but we managed to communicate with this YouTube following and ask people who wants to try this for themselves. And what we managed to do is we found people who were willing to literally get out of their doors, go out into the streets and start their own sing-alongs on trains and buses and ferries. And so we did a global sing-along where we set a date and we invited people to sing two songs. One of them was a song of cultural significance, something that was important to the people of that land, of that area, mm. and then a Bob Marley song, Three Little Birds. Nice. Everyone sent us the video and we stitched it together to show the world singing together as one spontaneously in public spaces all over the world. Yeah, Damn, that's so powerful, man. It's next level subscribership. Yeah. That's beautiful, bro. That's yeah. actually really... I was getting tingles as you were saying that story. That's how beautiful that message is. Mm. And so well needed. Um, can I re re rewind and go back into, um, did you, what were you doing before the Liberators Movement and this line of work? And how did, you, how did this mm. unfold for you in the very beginning? I've always loved bringing people together and I've loved crazy adventures. Like my life has just been a crazy adventure after crazy adventure. And from a young age, I've had visions um, dreams, desires of something that could be achieved if we work together. Something more beautiful that could only be accomplished if we actually work together to do it. And uh, the first group that I ever formed was actually, it's pretty random, but we were called the Sexy Bitch Club. This Sexy is in, Bitch Club. This is in year seven. Oh, oh wow. This is the original like formation of the like club and some form of leadership. And what we used to do was wear our clothing, our uniform, mm. a little bit different to everybody else and every day every week we would have a different thing we'd wear a hat to the side or jumper inside out mm. and the interesting thing about that was people started wanting to wear their hats in different ways and so it was already kind of I've, from a very young age I've loved playing with culture I've loved working with humans I've loved looking at ways that we can play with the norm mm. not just to follow what's always been said or been done, but to actually reinvent things in a more beautiful way. So looking back through my life, it's just been thing after thing of nice. uh, just absolutely loving the human experience and being curious as fuck. What are some of the things that have really stood out to you as far as group mentality, the psychology behind it all, and how to really shape and manipulate culture? Seemingly impermeable changes can very quickly become changes if the crowd slash the group are in love with it. So someone might be very rigid in their thinking, but if their five best friends all change their way of thinking, they very quickly will start to look at changing their way of thinking. Mm. Um, I've always found that so fascinating and so interesting. And part of what we do with our social experiments where we go onto trains and we invite people to sing along, we'll probably bl bring like five people extra who look like everyday citizens. Mm -hmm. who just say, yeah, I'm going to give this a go. I'll start singing. Yeah. And we don't force anyone to actually sing. We just create a few other examples of singing being a good possibility, which is fun, and we don't get shamed for it. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how powerful that can be to shift social behavior in a beautiful way. Yeah, sometimes the, the first person to do it is the hardest. So if you have that already set up, then it is trickling effect, right? Or mm -hmm. trickle effect. That's yeah. epic. And um, who inspires you when it comes to this sort of stuff and culture and social movement? And what, what really sparked your mind to be like, I'm going to go and try and mess with culture and change it and <laughs> beautify it? Mm. 
Interesting. There are a lot of great inspirations. You know, Richard Branson was a huge inspiration for me. Um, he, he just talks about just doing it. Um, Virgin Records. Virgin Records and, yeah. you know, he was just fascinated in creating value and connecting the dots mm. and um, spoke of how transformational your life can become if you look at ways to be valuable and connect the dots. And also not to listen to the norm. You know, he does a lot of like edgy experimental kind of marketing campaigns, mm. um, world record attempts and stuff like that. Yeah. Because um, he loves living life and he loves, you know, seeing what might happen if he takes it to the edge. So I think Richard Branson's definitely played a, a big wow. role in, you know, enabling me to look at the world like this and, and fall in love with, with doing something different. Yeah. The, the book that he wrote, or his biography was the first, one of the first biographies I've ever read was his one. And he has a very fascinating story when we first started out and how he set himself apart and lived on a boat and had all these, this extraordinary guy. Mm -hmm. You can see why he's a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Liberators Movement, where did that originate? It actually originated while I was living in Spain, um, Barcelona. And I had intentionally left what I knew to go to a place where I didn't have any friends, didn't have any family, couldn't speak the language because I realized that so much of my upbringing was somewhat connected to my own privilege in a way, somewhat connected to my family's connections or my understanding of where to go and how to talk and all that stuff. Mm. I realized that I was kind of living a life that was slightly expected of me at the same time. Um, I'd studied accounting and entrepreneurship and realized that that's not really why I was here. I had something else to bring and I didn't know what it was. And I couldn't hear my inner voice as clearly as when I was overseas uh, studying abroad in the Netherlands, which happened before I moved to Spain. Netherlands. And I started to meet other people and ask questions about like, what am I really here to do? Like, I've somehow been blessed with this life's existence. I've managed to get through my teenage years without any significant traumas no broken bones <laughs> no no broken bones and what am i going to do with it like what am i mm. going to do with this life and i didn't know what the answer was but i thought if i could find myself in a place where i had no connection somehow figure out who i was and what i was here to bring so that i could wake up every morning just feeling so excited to jump into what i do mm. then uh, that'd be a worthy endeavor so bought a ticket to spain and started meeting other inspirational people and interviewing them as well and nice. um, experimenting with life and just figuring out like what is it that really makes me feel radiantly alive but also is of value to this outside world and um, hopefully builds a better future for, for tomorrow. Mm. So what was it that made you feel radiantly alive? Like what hooked you? Um, I think it was this kind of peering back beneath the veil or behind the veil of what I thought reality was and I've been told these stories. We all get told stories. We're always getting told stories. And it's fascinating how many stories are kind of maybe unsubstantiated or don't actually relate to the truth if you dared to try it yourself. So the first thing that I did was I blindfolded myself in a plaza with a sign at my feet that said, I trust you. Do you trust me? Let's hug. And I was looking at this idea of like, can we trust strangers? Because my inner narrative the one that I'd received from newspapers and stuff was around like, you should not trust people. Stranger danger, right? Stranger danger, stay the hell away from these people. Um, and I was like, you know what? I just want to try it and see what happens if I give people an opportunity to show their trust or show their love and respect. And I was blown away because there was practically a line of people waiting to give me a hug. And when I looked back at the video footage, I saw not only was I, were people lining up, I could tell there was a circle around me and people were pretty much like protecting me in a way. They were actually like looking out for me in a way. So I felt like if someone was to take advantage of me, there'd be so many people watching, seeing that this person was trying to do something beautiful that I would actually have been protected by that. Wow. And that was just mind blowing and eye opening. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> wow. How many other parts of society and humanity have I just not dared to try? because I had this story in my head that it's not safe or you can't do that or people aren't able to do that yeah. or that'll never work. So then I was like, hmm, 
I just felt so alive. I was like, yeah. wow, what's next? That's interesting. Um, what do you think about that scenario made people protect you and, and come around and say, like, in, that, in that respect, was it the way you wrote the sign? Because sometimes in day-to-day life, people don't have that instinct for someone naturally. Mm. It has to be sort of sparked within them. Like, do you know what really creates that spark to activate someone to help and protect and, and serve another? Mm. I think something, uh, there's a few factors. One of them is like innocence. You know, yeah. you look at like a child and, and how naturally people wish to protect children. Mm. Um, I think there's something about innocence. So because I blindfolded myself, I was already like a couple of steps down in terms of my advantage or in terms of what I could see and do. Um, so that created a sort of sense of innocence. Mm. Um, but also I think when people dare to do something which is in service to something greater than the self or in service to something that's almost altruistic in design, uh, generally speaking, humans, humanity likes to support that, likes to protect that, um, likes to enable and, and help that move forwards. So Beautiful. Yeah. So the Liberators was born from those moments. And when you first created the Liberators, was it primarily uh, based around dance and partying? Or was, what is the real essence of the Liberators? And how do, you f- how do you formulate your first workshop or your first event? Mm. And what were the main components that make the Liberators what it is today? Um, it wasn't the Liberators in the beginning. It, it was wasn't? actually called Good Vibrations Barcelona. Good Vibrations. Yeah. Oh. And um, we realized that we could create these positive vibrations that could send ripples and also Mm. create stories. And I was really fascinated in this idea that um, how do we empower everyday citizens to have stories that inspire their families? Um, Because I was was really fascinated, not so much in the celebrities who were like coming in and saving the the African village. I, I was like, we're just the everyday people who are doing these beautiful things for the world and Mm. how can we each become our own storytellers of positive change and positive influence because I think that if we can all kind of start to look at ways that we can beautify and you know amplify the the goodness in our hearts um, that can lead to a cascading you know avalanche of goodness so that was the beginning I was like I can't expect anyone to do it until I start doing it first (laughs) Mm. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll start doing it. I was looking around for it and I couldn't find it in this specific way at least. So I thought I'll start doing it. And before long, I literally had people knocking on my door asking if they could help um, from all over the world as well. It wasn't just like an Australian thing or a Spanish thing. It was like Chinese people were knocking, French people were knocking, people from Africa, Senegal, everyone was coming together. And I was just like, there's something going on here. (laughs) There's Mm. something humanitarian happening here that I am just so fascinated by and um, surprised that it's not a focus. Um, I was also really curious about just stripping dogma right back. I was like, I don't need this to be about converting to anything. I don't even need you to know or believe in what it is that we're doing. It's just, if it feels good and you can see the goodness happening, then yeah, I invite you to be a part of that. And. Um, yeah, uh, that has been a, a driving force to try and simplify the acts of goodness yeah. and make it really accessible and tangible, you know, not just this like hypothetical, illusionary thing, but like, mm. oh, what can we actually do that will make a difference in someone else's life? How can I change my behavior um, wow. to influence that? So that's kind of at the essence of it. Yep. Um, and then we've just explored it in as many ways as possible. Um, in public spaces that then led to global events that then led to private events because we had a community that kept loving what we were doing but we we're always in service to humanity mm. and i was like when are we going to actually spend time with the people who love being in service to humanity let's be in service to each other as well so that's kind of when we yeah. started building a community uh, and that was when the liberators kind of started forming and that's been fascinating to look at the the undercurrent there so there's this outward-facing entity that is in service to humanity, but then there's this inner community of people who we are nurturing and fostering loving relationships with mm. and enabling slash helping and supporting each other to find their gifts and give them away, pretty much. Beautiful. Find ways to align people with their heart's calling or with the why they're here and support them in those endeavors. 
and then that just ripples out, you know. So I don't want or need everyone to become a liberator. Um, I feel like we each have this thing that's of equal significance inside of us based upon our skills and abilities that uh, is here to serve the greater good of the world. And that's really what it's about, you know. I'll do it through my skills and abilities to yeah. do it in my own way. But uh, ultimately the message comes back to, you know, what is each and everyone's gifts and how can we harness them to create more beauty, love and connection in the world. Wow. Looking at it from the outside in, I was looking at liberators as I thought you guys were doing, you know, events and like more so parties and DJing, things like that. I didn't know it was that influential and as the picture you painted. So it's really beautiful to see the whole essence of it and mm -hmm. things you do are inc incredible. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned when you went to um, Barcelona or you went to Europe, outside of all your connections and the way you grew up, your inner voice strengthened. Yes. What do you think it was about being on your own that made your inner voice so strong? Silence. <laughs> yeah. Emptiness, um, <clears throat> like not having friends call me all the time, not having mm -hmm. people texting me, not having my parents asking me questions. Like when you move to another country, like people don't just call you randomly. It's not as often mm -hmm. at least. So you're literally just left there. And I spent the first couple weeks like sitting a lot, which was really strange. But I was just like, wow, I've not actually been by myself for so long. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful. I actually love it here. And then with time, you know, I just sort of started to tune in a little bit to like what my inner whispers were trying to say and um, started writing them down pretty much. Write a blog, wrote, started writing a blog. Nice. And um, by writing without an agenda, great, highly recommended thing for anyone looking to find access to their inner voice or the mm -hmm. why they're here, write without an agenda. And then if you do it enough, just keep writing what you care about, write what you think is interesting, write what you think is what you want to know about. And uh, I dare you to share it as well, because that takes it up another level. Mm. Um, but what you'll find is there'll be a tendency of themes that just keep coming back. Like when you get given full freedom to write about stuff, you'll probably find that there'll be this like core theme that just keeps coming back again and again and again. And it's kind of easier to look back on yourself like that and sort of pick out the common thread. And that's part of what I did. Um, to help gain clarity on, on the who I was, along with meeting other people who have dared to listen to their own voice and not just follow what's expected. Um, yeah. yeah. What was the tipping point when you went to this new country, no contacts, no nothing, and all of a sudden you built a business and you were thriving and the things were happening? What was the tipping point that made all those things possible? Had a few mentors that really supported me along the way. Mm. Um, they were amazing human beings, much older men generally, and uh, we, uh, some of them entrepreneurs, successful business people. Other was a policeman who used to take me into the mountains and we'd do language exchange, climbing mountains together. And wow. um, he really helped me find like inner masculinity and strength, inner strength, almost like father like qualities. Um, that was a really powerful experience. I learned a lot from Jose. And this was in Europe? Yep. Oh, epic. Yeah. How did you meet these mentors? How does that sort of thing happen? Is it um, natural or did you have to go and seek out a mentor? Uh, I wasn't looking for a mentor. I was looking for people I could learn from, mm. I would say, and looking for wise elders, I guess. Um, I generally like to surround myself in people that know more than me. Mm. Um, and yeah, I love learning from other people. And people are my books, actually. More so than anything else, I love humans and I love listening and learning through people. And um, it's been a big part of my life. So yeah, I just sort of, they just sort of arrived and I just felt better with them by my side. And they obviously loved having me around as well. So it was a mutual thing. And mm. I think they could tell that my intent was focused on something other than what the mainstream orientation of life force was focusing at, focusing on. And I think other people who've dared to do something different with their lives, when they notice young people who are on their way asking bigger questions, daring to peer behind the veil mm. and uh, you know, lean into something beyond just the, the endeavors of finding more money or as much money as possible yeah. or self-indulgent hedonism or whatever it is. Um, I think they notice that and they want to support that. Mm. Um, it's that elder role thing. You know, I think elders generally, they care less about what they're doing and they now just want to pass what they know to those who are ready. Beautiful. I guess when you're, when you're ready, the master appears though. Something like that. Yeah, that old, that old saying. Mm. These are some interesting stories, man. Um, okay, so cultivating curiosity was something I saw on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, 
how does someone cultivate more curiosity and obviously get into a, a playful state more? Mm. I know a lot of people, especially um, even myself, can be very rigid mm. and not, and we sort of lose that touch of that inner, inner playfulness and the curiosity. Yeah. What have you found really ignites that? Hmm. I find moments in nature with friends, <laughs> especially mm. creative friends, open-minded friends. Yeah. There's something about this this kind of non-judgmental, non-in-human, um, you know, structured space, the mm. organic nature of nature is, is very freeing. And it's this massive museum. And there's just little creepy crawlies everywhere. And mm. um, I feel like I can yell louder than I ever yelled before. And I'm not going to, like, piss off my neighbours and they're mm. not going to freak out and call the cops. I can climb trees. I can jump in the river. I can get immersed in it. I can hear sounds that I've never heard before. And it freaks me out at night time or... All of this kind of compounds on top of itself to create an environment where you're more free in your mind. Mm. Um, and if you, if you combine that with um, good people who are willing to explore presence and creativity, mm. you'll find the, the quality of your presence. A lot of it has to do with presence as well. Um, it will deepen and from that space, I think beautiful things can form. So okay. that, that would be one, one way to cultivate yeah. curiosity. And a big one I wanted to ask you about, because you said within your workshops and in your Liberators movement, you're helping people find their purpose and give it to the world. What were some of the things that you, that you found um, help people find their purpose and really ignite it? Mm. And is that quite a common theme you're seeing in your events, people looking for more purpose? Uh, it is less directly, more um, broadly it's happening um, mm. through people's own curiosity, seeing it happen in front of them meeting other people who want to try things. Mm. Um, the greatest way to get started is to literally look at hosting a workshop for your friends. Like, what would you do if you wanted to host a workshop? What do you want to share? Like, what do you actually think mm. that you've got a little bit of knowledge on? <laughs> and this isn't the end of your world and this is not what you're here to do for the rest of your life or anything. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, commit to the, the act of showing up to share something that you feel like you have some knowledge in. And I think the answer will reveal itself quite naturally. So if you stand up in front of your friends and you just kind of have nothing to talk about, you're like, well, this probably isn't the right thing to be talking about. Mm. And they're your friends anyway, like, well, we've ordered pizza anyway, let's have pizza and hang out. This isn't going to work, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so just, just lower the bar, but still show up and dare to sh and actually have intention around sharing something. And it's sort of like playing baseball versus reading about baseball, you know? Like you can try to read and find like what you're supposed to do and be like, oh yeah, that's the thing. But it's not until you pick up the baseball bat and have a ball thrown at you and you just like smash it mm. that you actually feel like, oh, I think I like this. Yeah. Um, so just find an excuse to do it. Do mm. something that you care about and the, the path will, continue, will reveal itself. Beautiful, man. That's a, that's a really nice and simple answer, which... <laughs> Excellent. Um, okay, man. Now, your plans, besides the Bliss Festival, mm. what, what do you, where do you see the Liberators movement going and yourself going and what is your work growing into? Where do you really want to move this vehicle well, It's to? all about world domination, mainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, that Com makes sense. Complete, <laughs> complete takeover of, yeah. of all the countries, mainly. Um, you know, humble things, simple beautiful, things. Beautiful world domination, I like yeah. that. <laughs> um, You're all liberated. <laughs> Yes, exactly. It's all part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Love and light, yes. Um, no, look, so I, I'm really interested in the global events now that COVID is sort of cleared. Mm. Um, I'm actually really fascinated in, in ways that we can come together as a people internationally mm. um, to create acts of love and kindness. Um, so... We already have community leaders all over the world who are literally so hungry to stand up again and to be a part of this waving of the international flag that uh, I'm excited to, to look at, you know, different ways that we can do that. So previously we've done a few things. One of them is a global dance party through the streets and uh, created a MP3 mix of music, which was about an hour long, had music from around the world. People submitted different ideas from their local areas, mm. um, different rhythms, Latin rhythms, you know, big electronic beats and all sorts of variety. And uh, I put instructions on, over the top of it. It was like a spoken word journey mm. um, that people all press play at the same time to. So you, can, you wow. bring together groups of people, 50 people, meet up in the center of the city, 
get your colorful clothes on and a few ingredients that was in the menu um, that you needed to bring with you, like a small bubble mix or okay. colorful cloth. And we go three, two, one, press play. And then you get taken into this immersive journey. It's like the opening to the Matrix credits. You know, it's got this like grand, you know, orchestral beginnings. And then it's this like grand voice which welcomes you in and uh, invites you on this journey where the first thing you could do would be to hand out a high five to a stranger. And we'll drop some funky uplifting reggae and people just like split and go like hand out high fives to strangers and then they come back together again. And um, they go on a journey pretty much through the city, like dancing it out, unified, handing out high fives, blowing bubbles, waving colorful flags above their head, getting it on camera, sending all the footage back to me, and I compile it into a global compilation of the world dancing together as one. And uh, I see that as a really valuable thing to be doing with time. Yeah. Um, you know, the more of us who can actually feel like we've got a role to play in building bridges of unity, um, I think the more empowered and in love we become with the, being a human and, and mm. the, the power that we have these days to actually uh, tell a more beautiful story. So I'm feeling connected to the global events and uh, doing a bit more of that. Nice. That, that, that's epic, man. Um, do you post this content just on your social media? Or do you, what, what channels do you use to really post that, that active content of the global stuff? Uh, the global stuffs. It's on the Facebook page and the YouTube channel. YouTube yeah. channel is probably the easiest way to go, which is the Liberators International. Okay. Um, search that on YouTube, you'll find it. And um, yeah, there's a bunch of the global videos and the local videos there. Nice. Are you on TikTok as well, the Liberators? Nah, I kind of can't be bothered getting into TikTok to be honest with you. It. And yeah, yeah um, I've heard it's great. I've heard it's a great way to get out there, but um, yeah. I've already kind of built a bit of a following, and fair enough. It yeah. seems to be working for the time being. So that's perfect, man. You're yeah. exclusive. YouTube. <laughs> that's it, that's it. Yeah. Oh, that's epic. Um, I think a lot of your, your gigs as well, like out in nature, you had this floating setup, I think on boats mm -hmm. and on the pontoon and things like that. Yeah. Um, what makes you want to do these things that are so different and radically different in, the, in this sort of dance and freedom mm. space? Mm. Yeah, we did, the did you face any challenges when you were setting this? Always, this always, up? always, always. Yeah. So that's a big part of what I just am so passionate about is <clears throat> creating tangible experiences that show people that a seemingly obvious space can be transformed into something magical and mystical and wonderful. Mm. And uh, it's part of what we do all through Blissfest is we reinvent seemingly normal parts of a festival and turn them into more beautiful parts. Mm. Like the toilets, for example. If you're waiting to go to the toilet, that's normally like, oh God, here we go, I've got to wait to the toilets. Mm. We put... Um, karaoke TV screen on top of the toilets so that while you're waiting you can sing songs that have references to um, pissing and <laughs> shitting pretty much so drop it like it's hot oh. um, things like that push it real good oh nice and you're not missing out on any action you know and you're actually creating something awesome and hilarious and you're singing with a few strangers whilst you're waiting to go to the toilet and then yeah. while you're going to the toilet you can hear everyone be like push it real good <laughs> do 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 that's, that, that's actually awesome um, so yeah, we, I just love this idea that we can, um, <clears throat> yeah, play with life, you know, life doesn't have to be the same thing. And there's a, there's a deeper message in all of this. And it's that right now we're a lot of the time we're carrying these heavy expectations, these heavy weights on how we should feel like we need to be showing up. And a lot of that is actually kind of burning resources to perpetuate a dream that was sufficient maybe for our parents' generation but we're still wanting the approval from our parents, for example. So we're still mm. continuing to endeavor to do these things so that we get you know, seen as you know, successful in, in their eyes. Yeah. But uh, so much of society's definition of success is kind of aged and dated and uh, incongruent with a, uh, a life that is in harmony and, and is more sustainably focused. So that's part of why I love to involve people in these moments where they're like, I didn't know you could do that. Mm. Um, so that people can hopefully start to question themselves a little bit about like, I wonder what else I'm doing and just sort of moving through it mindlessly where I could actually reinvent that. Wow. So. I'm getting a really fascinating picture on, on, on your work and how important it is and how culture is so influential of changing well, the world essentially. Mm. As you said, world domination <laughs> of love and light, but it, culture is a really powerful tool to, for change. Around radical change, yeah, which I'm seeing more and more just in this conversation. Like, wow. So, um, so we, we, were, we wanted to look at, like, so how can we create a culture which is more loving, more open-hearted, more honest, 
more um, willing to collaborate, uh, more radiantly alive. Um, and what are the conditions that we require as, as humans for that to occur? And um, we've just been playing with that. Like, how do we dial that in, you know, like more, more beautifully? And a lot of the time, safety plays a big role. Like, how do we help each other feel safe? Because mm. when we don't feel safe, we lock up, we protect ourselves, we put on the mask, we pretend to be something that we're not. When we feel safe, we can actually reveal parts of our truth, parts of our authenticity. And from that place, I think, you know, um, love, friendships can really thrive from an authentic, beautiful place. And yeah, that's part of the culture that we're wishing to sort of cultivate and build. Epic. Um, why not be able to dance through the streets freely if it feels good? 100%, yeah. It's and not it does, hurting it anybody. I think when you're at your happiest, you're dancing or a lot of people dance when no one's watching. Mm. You know, but if you do that everywhere, it's the complete embodiment of freedom, right? Exactly. Um, I had a question, but I lost it. <laughs> I thought I something really important. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. What was the biggest obstacle that you had to face or the biggest fear you had to face in becoming the man you are today and doing the work that you do that is so embodied in freedom and expression? Mm. For some, that may not be easy, but how did you get to this point? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge was pretty much being seen as someone who was wasting their time doing something that didn't make any sense or wasn't really leading towards a, you know, future that I could buy, buy a house with. Like, that'll never work. Like, why are you wasting your time doing this frivolous, silly, temporary, transient stuff that just mm. disappears into the ether? Like, you'll never make a difference, you know, doing all this. And uh, that was a big, big part of the energy that I received. And that was that your inner voice, or that was people telling you these things? Uh, it was a mixture, okay. yeah, mixture of people telling things, people thinking things, and my own inner monologue as well, based mm. upon, you know, how I'd met people and what I thought people thought were important. Um, that was really tough to overcome, mm. um, and it was also really tough to say yes to becoming a leader. That was another really challenging moment where I was like, God damn it, people keep trusting me with their fucking, in, like, um, with, the, with their time. They mm. trust me with my vision and they keep wanting to almost give me this status or this place of leadership. It keeps being bestowed upon me. And I remember having some real, like, challenges around, like, you know, this egoic thing or, like, being greedy or being, like, controlling or taking people's time and, like, who do I think that I am to want to lead people and uh, am I even you know qualified to do this and all, all mm. those you know self-doubting self-limiting yeah. beliefs um, but I remember literally just thinking to myself I'm like I'm, I'm gonna say yes to this this is part of what my life's path has led me to and I see how valuable it is and how many lives are getting changed by, by me leaning into this and I think as mm. long as I orient my actions around not just my own you know boosting myself up but actually every time people give me their um, faith mm. uh, I listen to them and then I'm also in in deepest service to to the awakening of consciousness and the people around me not myself beautiful is that, is that how you overcame those voices of doubt <laughs> yeah I was like, as long as I position myself in a place that is in deep service mm. to humanity and deep service to the to the greater good of, of the people around me and not just my own perpetuation of my epicness <laughs> um, then I feel like I can probably do some leadership stuff. I think that's worthwhile. Yeah, okay. That, that's cool. Um, I got another thing which is valuable yeah. um, around finding the confidence to do some edgy stuff, <laughs> like mm. dancing on a train, like starting a dance party on a train. You know, that was terrifying the first time I wanted to do it. Mm. Um, and, and many people probably do are still very terrified of that. And I still am scared of it, but I have found a way to do it. Mm. And um, something that I connected to, which is kind of related to what I said before, was what's your intention to taking this risk? So is your intention oriented around something that's all about yourself? Or are you actually intending to try and create something beautiful, not just for you, but for others? Um, if you are focused on others and creating something beautiful for others, then that will generally enable uh, more of a green light energy from the people around you. Also, try not to put your sense of success on other people needing to do what you say. <laughs> True. Um, if you put your sense of success on your attempts and your tryings to do something that you feel is of goodness for the world, mm. then um, that's what you're trying to do. Um, 
So if you want to dance on a train, be like, yo, I'm going to dance because I love to dance. I think it feels great for the body. Mm. If you want to join in and also feel great, then do so. If not, that's cool as well. Yeah. And, then, and then there's like, there's no room for them to sort of be like, oh. That's true. Yeah. yeah. You've kind of announced it, then you just jump, in, jump into it. Yeah. What were the emotions you were experiencing when you first did that, the first one to dance on the train? Mm. I had a mixture of feelings. Um, can't remember specifically, but I also, I have this thing where for me to enable people to feel safe and for them to feel comfortable in my presence and for them to hopefully want to do something that feels right for themselves, the more comfortable I can become in my own inner being, the more at peace I can become in my own sense of belonging in the world and um, yeah, just calm with it. The easier people are like, they have, they don't feel the tension so much anymore and they can actually step into things more safely when they don't feel all the anxiety in there. And of course, I don't get to always choose. I'm sure my heart was pounding like crazy, but mm. the outer experience that I was projecting, I believe, was that of calm centeredness. And because um, mm. that's part of the greater cause of like, how do I enable the greatest unfolding of natural expression to occur? Uh, I need to be. Uh, feeling good in myself yeah. so it's a lot of emotional mastery and almost like keeping your your vision fixed on the greater good which removes the idea of self which removes the idea of anxiety mm. in a sense um, but what are some practices that you do uh, regularly to keep yourself in check to keep you as you said the um, the idea of your service to others and not service to the self and what are some things that you do to really keep yourself um, aligned yeah I collaborate with some great friends who are not afraid to Tell me how it is, and yeah. I really appreciate that in friends and uh, little ego checks here and there, because mm -hmm. um, it's tough as well. Like you know, you get into this leadership position, and you got so many people who love what you do, and yeah, there is a lot of energy moving towards me, and and, and to stay humble and and centered in that, it can be difficult. You know, the the mm -hmm. ego loves to creep in, but uh, yeah, so I, I generally have close friends that I can trust that that like to keep me in check, and. Um, I like to look at ways that I can also lower my status. It's an interesting endeavor, but um, do things that people of status don't normally do. So just like serving people tea and like, you know, making things for other people or like mm. being in service, like physically and tangibly to friends and showing up for other people and doing stuff like that, I find can help um, kind of keep me in check. Yeah. All right, now I've got a question for you. This is a big one. If there was an opportunity for you to speak to someone or speak to a billion people to go, or I'm sure you speak to 100 million already, but <laughs> let's just say every TV screen, or you have to get the choice to insert a thought or an idea into the collective consciousness that gets seeded, mm -hmm. what would that one message or, or thought be that you want everyone to sort of have or share in? Mm -hmm. Kind of putting you on the spot for that one. Yeah, it's a deep one. Uh, I, I'm feeling something along the lines of like, you are lovable, uh, worthy, and truly valuable. Mm -hmm. And what you have um, learnt, found, created on your life's path has a valuable key and a valuable role to play in inspiring slash enabling um, this world to become a better place. And I invite you to lean into that. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Very beautifully done. Such a small amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've seen you do a lot of business talks and keynote speaking and things to professionals and IT services, things like that. What's the nature of your work and what do you talk about in those professional settings? Mm. So we did rip your tie off and start a dance party. <laughs> I do do that. Um, <laughs> so it was interesting, you know, I left the accounting profession and I went to Spain and then I jumped into, you know, looking at ways to create bridges of love and, you know, human connection in public spaces mm. and managed to find some wild viral success through doing that. Um, TV stations wanted to interview me and I got invited to talk on the TED stage and oh, wow. 
I actually said no the first time and they called me a second time saying, yo, we really want you to come, like, come on. And I was like, all right, you killed me two times. I'm going to do it now. That's it. So had a had a coach kind of teach me the ways on storytelling and how I could craft my story in a beautiful way. And I knew that if I was going to talk about daring to be vulnerable and creating tangible experiences that help us build bridges of love and understanding, that I would need to make the TED Talk itself a daring adventure, something that literally and tangibly put me out on a limb in a way that I didn't know what was going to happen next. Mm. Um, so instead of starting with talking, something logical, I started in silence and then dropped a beat and proceeded to cut sick in my professional business attire <laughs> in front of business professionals all in the TED stage, TED audience, TED expert. And after that, people were looking just like, holy shit, what the hell is this? Mm. And then they're like, he's going to talk now. And I chose not to talk again. <laughs> and they're just like, squirming in their seats they're like what the fuck is this and then i slowly calmly coolly pull out my scissors and make my way over to my tie and make a nice cut and then say i used to be an accountant but then i realized my skills were better for building bridges of love and global flash mobs of kindness and uh <laughs> that was the beginning of the talk wow. so that ted talk gained some significant success and managed to get invited to talk to a number of different businesses through that, got employed by a speaker's agency. They picked me up and they started just getting me in front of all these different corporate clients to talk about the power of human connection, pretty much, mm -hmm. and the role that it plays and how we can facilitate um, authentic spaces that people love experiencing and want to keep coming back to. Mm -hmm. And that relates a lot to the working world and how do we create teams that love each other and that care for each other and want to support each other and see each other grow? And um, I used my life stories and the videos, you know, creating these social experiments to tell, a, tell another story about the role that we all have to create more inclusive worlds and um, places of love and connection. So, mm. and made it really interactive and, you know, so that's kind of what I go around talking about. Epic, man, epic. Mm. How do you think um, these big companies can actually build a better culture and with more human connection? And how, 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 should it, how should it look like mm. compared to how it is? Well, the, the fascinating thing is you just literally ask people, how can we make our workplace a more connected place for all of us? Mm. And literally get some conversations going, um, have it be a, like, a monthly thing that you kind of check back onto and turn it into a game. <laughs> that's, that's kind of about what I thought would be yeah. wonderful is um, once a month, you know, the greatest ideas on how we can create connection get like voted on or something along those lines. Mm. The one that gets the most votes gets implemented for the next month. Mm. People try it out for a month, whether that's people bringing in food on Fridays in the lunchroom to share at lunch, mm. or if it's um, choosing to take two of your staff members out for coffee, you know, that's like cool. a week. Yep. Um, just one-on-one, 30-minute -on -one, coffee catch-up, whatever. The people have so many great ideas. I like it. It's like a culture democracy. Yeah, and it's focused in the direction of how we can make it more enjoyable for everyone, mm. how we can create it, a space that's more um, oriented around you know, human connection and a supportive environment. And so, yeah, the people with the most knowledge are the ones who work generally. Uh, it's yep. just that they need to be asked the right questions and given the right environment where it's supported because a lot of the time people could be shamed or pushed down or seen as stupid for daring to propose that we should bring food together on a Friday. But mm. if it's a team effort and it's really coming from the whole organization that says, look, we see value in this. Um, we want you guys to love coming to work. Then, uh, you know, you can build a culture around that. Wow. Mm. I like that. That's, a, that's one. I'm definitely going to remember that. <laughs> um, I think I was going to ask you, um, how should we be living with culture is in our society in general? Like, is the way we're living now the best way we could be living? Are we meant to be living in tribes or villages and things like that? Or how do you really think humanity should be moving towards uh, as a whole? Mm. Um, I feel like interdependence, um, cooperation serves a great role. And then also connection to community. So not just your mates, which is like a very select little bubble of friends, mm. but to actually have 
something that we're a part of that is beyond our direct friends group where we interface with people who don't necessarily believe what we believe mm. um, but have their own unique skills to bring. And the more that we can kind of create these small pods of people who care for each other and also care for their land and the space that they're in, I think, um, yeah, we can create a beautiful, more beautiful world for everyone. Um, yeah, I've got a friend actually who started a project called the Town Team Movement. Okay. I think he's doing an, an amazing thing for society pretty much. And uh, mm. he started doing festivals, but he has moved into sort of this space of people power, empowerment, grassroots people power. And he thought there should be a fourth layer of government, which isn't local government. It's actually this non-political group of citizens who live in a space, live in a suburb, mm. and come together to talk about how they can make living in their suburb a more wonderful experience. Wow. So right now, local government has to juggle a whole hundred things, like, mm. you know, architectural approvals and you know rubbish bin collection and rangers things and dog bites and mm. all that stuff and oh yeah they've also got community development and they normally have like two or three community development officers oh, okay. who are responsible for building community mm. but why would you leave it up to just three people in an organization when you could literally invite the community yeah. <laughs> to kind of take that pressure off the, net the network and mm let the people become more proudly connected to doing things that they care about. Mm. And uh, he's grown to like 100 suburbs, 100 councils. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, he's currently going for state funding and uh, yeah, it's really growing. So I just love wow. that idea. I think it's super yeah. simple, really powerful. What kind of things were you doing? Did you hear about some? Um, heaps of stuff, you know, just like get togethers where they'd block off like a street, you know, and mm. then they'd turn it into like a people powered sharing of local markets and like local cool. artistry artisans and um you know chalk paintings on the on the ground and just creating spaces where people become the focus more so than you know mm. shops or you know roadways so yeah that's that. really cool it would have been very difficult to start up in the beginning i'd imagine but as you gain traction yeah um from your experience or from your memories what's what's been the most profound experience you've had either spiritually, emotionally, or through, through your events that has really changed the shape of your life? Big question, but something come to mind? Yeah, there's, there's a few key moments. I think the, the moving to different countries has, has always been a profoundly transformational experience. Yeah. Uh, living in the Netherlands for seven months and then Spain for three years. Um, but also, being in a long-term relationship with a partner for seven years. We're no longer right. together, but... Uh, seven years. She, yeah. She was okay. with me from the very beginning of Liberators and was truly formative on, on my thinking and just an amazing woman, really, who, mm. who helped me think more deeply and, and uh, look at the spaces between the spaces and, and uh, yeah, enabled me to look and think about the world from a new perspective that uh, has deeply enriched my whole approach and, and the way that I show up. So, mm. yeah. Wow, that's powerful. Mm. Um, that's pretty much all, all of my questions, man. Was there anything else that sort of came to your mind that you wanted to speak about? Or a question that you wish people would ask more often? Uh, I'm curious what your message to the people would be. Um, to the people. Um, well, the, the ask the question that you asked me before. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I haven't asked myself that question before, but um, I guess it would be for people to really go within and um, spend a lot of time in solitude to find out who they are, but also to realize their power and influence and um, how truly important they are and how much power we have as individual sovereign beings to, to make change and to, to be a catalyst for someone else and um, never underestimate the impact we can make from our little and small decisions. We're not here by an accident. So mm. I think trying to find ways to discover that um, and hone into their purpose is really powerful. And that's beyond the, the material world, so to speak. It's not just about your know, family, houses, cars, and your career, but it's also about how can you make this world different or better before your time is done? Mm. That's probably, I'm gonna polish that up a little bit more, but mm -hmm. that's basically what it would be. Sweet. Yeah. It's beautiful. Love it. Um, and where else have you actually traveled to besides Netherlands, 
Uh, I've had some other really powerful Spain. experiences, actually. Um, one of them was hitchhiking from Barcelona in a business suit, um, Barcelona to Croatia in a business suit and normal clothing. Hitchhiking? Yeah. Is that like a safer thing in Europe? Or? Um, I've done it in Australia before, nothing happened. But um, the trust in humanity again, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I was already curious about it. So that was a transformational experience for sure. Mm. And that's actually what got me into public speaking because I went on this journey to explore life outside the comfort zone and promised myself not to live in any hotels or hostels. Uh, I was going to do Gumtree, oh, sorry, not Gumtree, uh, couch surfing or just find a spot to sleep for the night. Wow. Um, never managed to get to any couch surfers' houses. I'd like lined a few up, but never actually mm. got there because you can't really control where the... How time. do you find a couch to surf? There's a website called Couchsurfing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> literally Couchsurfing. It's an awesome, awesome service. Um, so that that was profound, and I discovered things about trusting humanity, and also not judging a book by its cover, and um, how quickly people make snap judgments about you if you're wearing a suit or normal clothing. And I literally mm. came back with so many stories to tell. I was like, I'm going to host an event down at my local pub and invite everyone down there. Uh, and strangers showed up, my friends showed up, it was like 80 people in the room, and I just told these six key takeaway messages that changed my life, and um, showed them with photos and told them the tales. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the beginning, of it, and people loved it. They well, like, what they were, were these six keys that you found from this? Oh, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, because yeah. uh, it was many years ago. But um, one of them was this idea that because I'd been, this morning I was in Cannes and I'd taken, I'd hitchhiked from a guy, I don't think who had slept, and he took me to this spot and dropped me off in this really dangerous spot where the <laughs> cops ended up picking me up by eight o'clock in the morning and they said, you can't hitch here, it's dangerous. And then um, I said, well, you know, I'm from Australia, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and he's like, Australia, what the hell are you doing here in France? And I'm like, uh, like hitchhiking on the side of the road. So I'm like, Look, I'm on an adventure and blah, blah, blah. And he's, He's like, all right, well, look, we know of a better spot you can actually hitch from. So jump in the paddy wagon. Oh, nice. And uh, off we go down to the spot. He asks me, oh, he's, oh, you're from Australia. Do you know a guy called you know, Bill Rogers or something? And <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, nah. <laughs> it's funny how they try. But yeah. uh, anyway, it was a good, lovely little chat. And um, they dropped me off in this beautiful location. And it's got a tree for some shade and beautiful long vista. And I'm, I'm like, sweet. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to definitely get a ride out of this. Uh, lots of room for people to sort of slow over, turn over. And I put my thumb out and I literally waited there for like a couple of hours in, this, wow. in the sweltering heat in the summertime and no one pulled over. Wow. And I thought to myself, what should I do? Should I keep pushing and like trying or yeah. should I literally just pass out? <laughs> a little higher. <laughs> yeah. Or should I just pass out and sleep next to this tree? And I decided to sleep next to the tree. Um, I needed rest and... I woke up literally and the car, there was a car parked in front of me that had pulled over and there was a guy who was on his mobile phone. Oh. And I woke up to this car and I'm like, oh, I may as well ask this guy. <laughs> I was like, hey, are you heading to Italy by any chance? And he's like, yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> it's like, can I jump in with you? He's like, sure, no worries. Mm. Um, so sometimes in life, you know, when you really want something, um, you're really trying for it, sometimes the best thing to do is just have a sleep. Yeah, good point sleep it off and then come back with a fresh perspective and uh, can let things settle. So anyway, that was just one funny, simple little That's epic. takeaway. But mm -hmm. there were six of them, most of them more meaningful than that, but that was one that I remember. That's epic. Do you still have the videos? Or like, is, this, is this recorded yeah. content? Videos, photos. Or, or the Liberators Network on Nah, more YouTube? on my personal profile page. Okay, cool. That's uh, epic. When it comes to marketing your workshops and events, like how do you really get the, the word out to travel? Obviously, there's a lot of legwork you've done mm -hmm. that piggybacks on the other. Yeah. But um, just marketing advice to spread the message or spread the word for... Um, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. It's a massive beast of a thing. Um, mm. I love hearing stories. Tell a story. Um, mm. Tell a story behind what you're doing, like so people actually get to know you more, mm. get to know the organisers, get to know the vision, get to know a bit more of the why you're doing what you're doing. Mm. Uh, and they see your intention is beyond something like making money or whatever, you know, so... Assuming that that's not what you're all about and you've got something else to say and that you care mm. about, then uh, talk about that stuff. Um, other thing is make it fun, make it interesting, get to the point, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and be consistent. Care about it, have conversations, talk to people, um, ask for help. 
mm. be like, hey, I've got this event coming up and I'm looking for more people to, I'm looking for new ways to do stuff. Mm. Uh, it means a lot to me and I uh, wonder if you'd be open to just catching up and we can just brainstorm some ways to do things. So just getting a bit of that kind of accountability, yeah. like an accountability buddy uh, That's cool. can really help ratchet up, you know, the quality mm. and the frequency and, and the what you do. Wow. So simple but effective, eh? It's funny how my mind eludes these really simple things that actually work. I'm thinking about sponsoring and mm -hmm. marketing campaigns, which is just totally the most, it's not really natural and human, is it? It's, uh, anyway. Well, that stuff works as well, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty grassrootsy. Yeah, yeah, no, I like, like the organic way. Mm. All right, man, that's a, that's a wrap, man. Thank you so much, dude. That was uh, absolutely epic. Yeah, thanks for asking all the beautiful questions. No thanks for listening, if you made it through. Absolutely. Yeah, which is the weird trippy thing about the life, life's path, life journey. And yeah, there's been some fucking mystic shit going on as well. Like, <laughs> like yeah. some of my life has just been so mystical. Like, I, I'm not a I wasn't a spiritual person. I wasn't a religious person. I was literally just grew up without it, atheism. Yeah. And um, I completely didn't think that there was anything greater at play. I, I grew up very kind of just like matter of fact, you know, mm. and... Uh, then I started doing what I love <laughs> and like insane doorways would open for me. Like the most ridiculous doorways that I never even knew existed. Like mm. people would literally call me or send me an email and just be so touched by what I was doing that they would reveal this like opening for an opportunity to occur where I just like either get paid for it or they want to help me in some ridiculously beautiful way. Mm. And, um, that has just happened so many times on top of itself. <laughs> like yeah. just like these mystical, magical opportunities have literally come to me when I've aligned myself with my life purpose in a way um, that I'm like, okay, <laughs> something going on here. I'm just wow. gonna fucking ride this wave yeah. because this is magical and mystical as fuck. And yeah, I can't quite define what it is, but things keep happening where, where I feel um, something wants me to continue. Yeah, do you feel that's like you aligning with your soul or you aligning with God or source? And just... Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, I've, I've struggled with the God concept. I mean, I, li I like the, the, yeah, the source energy, but it's, I just, it's so hard to use words without alienating people. That's my struggle and challenge with it. Um, mm. I like to think that humanity wishes to help itself. Um, the goodness of humanity, the goodness of being human. Um, there is a part of, of everyone who wishes to enable beautiful humans to do beautiful things. Um, so it's like, you know, if someone's like raising funds for a, uh, a friend who was in a car accident who, you know, got injured, like the way in which even strangers kind of band together yeah. to wish to help that person who moved through that misfortune, the same thing happens, I feel, when, when we align ourselves to, to something that is leaning towards creating a positive ripple of change, you know, for, for the world or for humanity. And, 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 and people want to help that happen. And, mm. uh, yeah, that's, that's probably as like closely connected as I can kind of tie it without going too far out. Um, yeah. just cause I don't have enough information, but that's fair enough. Yeah. 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 Was um, it, when did this mystical stuff start happening? Was it, is this recently or when you first started taking your, your mission seriously? Um, it's kind of hard to tell. I don't really know exactly what happened. It's an interesting thing that my mum always told us that we were magical. And that's, um, and we had a magic opa, a magic grandfather. Mm. And uh, she'd always tell us stories about things that he could do. And I think that's a really interesting thing, just like feeling like you're magical or feeling like you have yeah. this capacity to change the scene. It's like an alchemy, you know, it's like transforming the seemingly inanimate into the animate. Yeah. Um, there, there's, uh, there's something powerful about that, um, about, having faith in the magic of the world, pretty much having a, d a thought that maybe something magical could happen. And it's your belief system. Uh, yeah, it and it enables more of it to, to occur on some level, I think. Because mm. um, if we're closed off to it, then we won't look at it, support it, want it to happen, and we'll close it down. But if we think of it as a possibility, then it, then it can find its way through. Uh, as to where and why and how, it's yeah. hard to define. Could you have any stories about your magical... Opa, that was shared. Was he like a wizard? Uh, yeah, it was kind of like a wizard. He was actually a leader of a slightly small rebellion movement, um, which ended up getting them into some trouble as well. So um, 
during World War Two, kind of oh, wow. you know, refusing the uh, the German rule and occupancy and that kind of stuff, and it, it actually led to some dangerous things that put some of the family at risk, and I think some of the family actually got taken away because of that as well. Was that in Europe? Yeah. Where where about in the Netherlands? Yeah. Okay, that's where your family's from. That's where my mother's side of the family is from. Okay, wow. Um, but yeah, so he had a movement that was against the Nazis. To that effect, yes. Yeah. Um, or was wow. you know kind of anti-war. Um, that's very brave, especially especially in those times, you know. Like totally. Yeah. World exactly. War Two was no joke. Mm-hmm. Do you know what what it was based on, or what it was based around? I don't actually. I'd like to know more, but um, yeah, it was. It was more just these like short little stories. I can't even remember the specifics of them, but mum would always tell us stories at the end of a day and I don't know about like what we're capable of. And she'd make things up all the time. Like you yeah. know, not all of it was probably a hundred percent true, but it was to some degree. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was a great man and he was capable of greatness and he did do magical, amazing things. And, you know, so that was all part of it. So yeah, I don't know. That, that, that tells a little bit of it. That's beautiful, hey? Having that, but she's so young, having that enforcement in your mind that magic is real, magic can happen, and you are magical. I mean, that's in the family, it's in the bloodline, yeah, you know? 100%. Yeah. That's, I'd love to be able to speak to your, your grandfather and hear about that story. Mm. Is he still alive today? No. 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 Great grandfather. Great grandfather, okay, yeah. fair enough. But hey, man, I can see a book there in the making that just sounds like a really cool story and movie potentially. Mm. Um, mm. So it's interesting how these archetypes can kind of find and form themselves again. And I don't know what role that played in, in, in me becoming who I am, but yeah, probably had something to do with it. <laughs> probably one of your guides or something who like really loving to see what you're doing, you know? Probably. Yeah. Family tradition. 